One of the things that I liked about the last house that I used to live in was the landscaping out front. The hedges, the shrubs, the little trees. After living there a couple of months, it occurred to me that those little shrubs and hedges weren't going to stop growing and they weren't going to trim themselves. So I got out my electric hedge trimmer and my extension cord and I got to work. They made good progress. Suddenly the machine went dead. I looked around. I'd cut the extension cord in half. But no worries, it's precisely for moments like these that one keeps a spare extension cord in the garage. So I went and got it and hooked it up, pulled the trigger, but nothing worked. I figured I must have tripped a breaker. So I went and looked. Everything, though, was fine. After checking more outlets and cords and breakers, all in vain, very embarrassed, I decided it was time to call an electrician. I was informed that somebody would be there in an hour or so, and the call-out fee was $99. Sure enough, the electrician arrived. She asked me what had happened. I appreciated the way she did that, because as I told her, there was no rolling of the eyes. There was no use of a word like idiot. And nor did she ask me the question, who let you outside with a, plow, with a power tool and unsupervised? I told her that I had checked the breakers, and she suggested that we go check them again, which of course sent its own subtext. We checked them and everything was in place, and then something very strange happened. She started muttering, where is it, where is it? I thought this was some sort of mantra or prayer that electricians pray to, to spark the electrical gods into action. And then she started to walk down one side of the garage with her fingers pointing, where is it, where is it, where is it? And she got to the back of the garage, where is it, where is it, where is it? And she worked down the other side, where is it, where is it? And she got about halfway and she stopped. And she pushed a cardboard box aside that hadn't been unpacked yet. And she said to me, see that outlet there? See that little button in the middle? If you push that in and go outside and see if it's working, come back and let me know. I did. It was. I told her. All of this had taken 72 seconds. And as she was getting her tablet out, she said to me, you might want to remember that little button. Subtext understood. She did some things on her tablet. She handed it to me. Here was the invoice. $100. And it was itemized. $99 call-out fee. $1 knowing where to look to reset system. I've often thought about that scene in a number of contexts because even in this age of incredible search engines, knowing where to look does not come so cheaply or so readily most of the time, does it? For example, people have looked in all sorts of places to find the meaning of life and for a very long time. We could think of the writers and the compilers of the biblical traditions as being on a quest to know where to look where to look to encounter God, to know divine presence, to know divine purposes, to know divine will. Big issues, I think, for contemporary progressive churches. These biblical writers look in all sorts of different places. They look to historical events. They look to the whole created order. They, they look to mysterious experiences. They look to daily life and its, and its structures. Many, many, many years ago in the days of the dinosaurs, a biblical scholar by the name of Samuel Terrian wrote a book on God and the biblical tradition. Terrian entitled that book, The Elusive Presence. 
knowing where to look for God is a riddle not so readily solved in 72, cent, in 72 seconds, let alone for a dollar. Of course, some folks are quite confident about knowing where to look. The gospel hymn writer declares boldly, you ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. In Elie Wiesel's complex and haunting literary work entitled Night, a work that, that narrates the experiences of a Jewish family under Nazi tyranny and in concentration camps in Auschwitz, Wiesel's narrator, Eliezer, a young man and a student of the Talmud, seeks God amidst the appalling atrocities of Nazi tyranny. Overcome by the extraordinary evil all around him, he wrestles with the death of God. Wiesel narrates a scene that some have understood to be the work's central scene. In the concentration camp, two adults and a child are executed by hanging, and the prisoners are forced to watch. During the hanging of the child, Eliezer hears one of the men ask, Where is God? Where is God? Not heavy enough for the weight of his body to break his neck, the boy dies slowly and painfully. And again, the man asks, where is God? And Wiesel's character responds, even as he wrestles with the reality of the death of God, quote, I heard a voice within me answer him. He is here. He is here. He is in front of you. He is hanging on the gallows. Those familiar with the binding of Isaac and with Jürgen Moltmann's crucified God, hear the resonances. God present in the suffering of the world. God present with and in the suffering of the most God-forsaken experiences people can undergo that we can inflict on one another. There is no place in all creation that is separated from the loving presence of God, to paraphrase the Apostle Paul, knowing where to look. But are such claims of divine presence enough? Present, but often without action or impact. Present without intervention, without deliverance, without change, without salvation. Job didn't think so. As he goes on a 40-chapter rant with his three friends, demanding not just divine presence, but divine accountability. The psalmist didn't think so. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And nor did the crucified Jesus. I think, I think it's Henry Nouwen, and if I have this wrong, forgive. I think it's Henry Nouwen who names the experience of powerlessness and divine hiddenness that every chaplain and pastor who's ever visited the emergency room in some sort of pastoral crisis knows only too well. Now and writes about how in the face of suffering and death, the medical folks, the doctors, the nurses have incredible roles and training and equipment and medication and special knowledge and vocab and resources and skills, all sorts of life-giving interventions. And the chaplain pastor has nothing except to be present. And sometimes he or she doesn't even have a prayer. Is it enough? Enough for what? It's a matter of expectation, I guess, to some extent. Parts of our tradition magnify, expand, enlarge, make God greater and bigger. So we expect greater and bigger things from God. Hashtag making God big again. There are those mighty acts that the tradition celebrates, the creation of the cosmos, the exodus from slavery, the return from exile, the resurrection of Jesus, the worst that an empire's tyranny can do, cannot keep the life-giving power of God at bay, they can't keep Jesus dead, confidently knowing where to look, the mighty acts of God. And of course, some folks have testimonies to God's miraculous interventions, healings, reconciled relationships, getting a job or a position, Supreme Court decisions, even, even finding a parking space. We used to sing a song once upon a time that feeds this expectation. You know it, it's got actions. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. It's a powerful affirmation. But I think if we had time, and if we had a whiteboard, and if we had markers, 
some of which worked, we could compile pretty quickly a list of the things that in our experiences God cannot or does not or will not do. Things we've prayed for or worked for earnestly. Things that seem to conform to the purposes and will of God, at least as we understand them, but they don't eventuate. And if we're honest, we're left wondering about ourselves, our unworthiness, our lack of faith, our unloveliness. And we're left wondering about the passivity, the impotence, the heartlessness, the indifference of a God who seems to have withdrawn favor or turned aside. And we're left wondering about the pervasive and abiding injustices and suffering for so many on planet Earth. It may or may not lead to the confession of the death of God, but it certainly alerts us to the dearth of the experience of God. Yes, there are miracles of power and love for some, but the state of our planet, its violence, its hunger, its disease, its inequalities, its greed, its bullies, its narcissists, its domestic abusers, its gun violence, its enduring injustices of racism and sexism and xenophobia, its overconsumption and all the rest of it raises the question, and here it is, are the blessings of some enough for the suffering of the many? Along with the recognition of the mighty acts of God and all those flashy miracles, the traditions recognize the small or the invisible acts or even the non-acts of God, knowing where to look in a different way. That's what I think this parable of the mustard seed is about. True to form, the parable is a comparison. The empire of the heavens, God's will and purposes and actions, are like the fate or the life cycle of the mustard seed. It's a tiny seed. It's sown. It's hidden in the ground, apparently accomplishing nothing. It's invisible in the present. It seems to be absent in the present. It seems hidden and doing nothing. It's out of sight. It reminds me of those various gardening efforts when the kids were little planting seeds in pots and in the garden only to find an eager four or five year old half an hour later impatiently digging through the dirt to see if the seed had grown any and wondering why not. But in the parable it's a little different because there's a contrast here. We have on one hand this tiny seed of God's empire in the present, sown in the field and invisible, and then some future time when it's grown, it'll become the greatest of trees. It'll provide hospitality for the birds of the air. There's a triumphant inevitability about the parable. There's certainty. There's growth. There's a future that'll be accomplished, and all wrongs will be righted. But is it enough? 2,000 years and counting? The parable's terms, the mustard seed is still now the present, small, out of sight. It certainly hasn't become a great tree. Are we simply to wait and see? Is it enough? There's another place where we might look. I think this is incredibly surprising given our horribly bad track record with one another. Mysteriously, it suggests that we look among ourselves that the kingdom or the empire of the heavens is within or among you, announces Jesus. That second parable I read this morning, it's a strange story, isn't it? You recall, the owner of the vineyard goes to the marketplace different times of the day, hires different day laborers to work in the vineyard. We have a reflection of a very hierarchical nature of the Roman world, common behavior of a wealthy landowner to exploit the labor of others for his own profit, and then, breaking stereotypes of a self-centered rich man, he does a surprising thing. He pays all the workers the same thing, regardless of how much or how little they've worked. Interpreters have argued about whether the owner represents God. I think not. He seems to be in the, story, in the story to be a wealthy guy. He retains the right to do what he wants with his own money. He's managing his vineyard to make a profit and enhance his wealth and status. There's no profound life change in the story. But in the midst of all of that daily life and commitments and values with his economic matters, he does something unusual. Momentarily, something surprising. Something somewhat dignifying and humanizing. He pays all the workers the minimum daily wage regardless of how long they've worked. 
day laborers were among the dregs of society. They were at the bottom. The owner doesn't pay them a huge amount of money. He doesn't set up college scholarship funds. He doesn't set up trusts for their families. He doesn't buy them all houses and vineyards of their own. There's nothing grand or miraculous. All there is is a little gesture, a momentary act. He pays them enough for the day to survive today, to get up tomorrow to do it all over again. Now, we could form an action reflection group and we could contemplate his action and we'd probably complain that it's, this isn't systemic change. It's mere charity. It reinforces the inequitable structures even. He could have done so much more with his resources. He could have made a permanent difference in their lives. And all of that's true. But while his act is small, it's not nothing. And it is significant. It dignifies them as people. It provides for them for this day. Without this gesture, they starve. And Matthew's Jesus declares that the kingdom, the empire of the heavens, is like this landowner who does the small but significant act in paying all the laborers the same amount, the daily minimum wage. It's not spectacular. It's not even generous. It's like myriad acts of care and support in the midst of life as usual, of invested time or energy or decency or skill or kind words or gestures of one human being to another for the benefit of another. I'm suggesting that at least one of the things that the parable might be doing is suggest another place to look, to encounter God's empire, purposes, and will. That they're encountered not only in the miraculous and the mighty acts, not only in the pain and the suffering, but in the small ways, in the momentary acts in the midst of daily life where ministry and leadership take place, in seemingly invisible ways and apparently minor and kind gestures, sometimes surprising, sometimes uncharacteristic acts performed by people who at least momentarily recognize and are present to the other. It's not the whole story, but it's a part of it. Knowing where to look, to find God. Somebody asked Rabbi Joshua one day, why did God speak to Moses from a burning thorn bush, a lowly, ugly, prickly, dirt common thorn bush that I have on good authority nobody ever tried to trim with an electric hedge trimmer? The rabbi replied, God used something very insignificant, a thorn bush, to be present to Moses. Was it enough? 